everybody once again. <coughs> if we can bring the house lights up. No. No. I was just kidding. Why you gotta tell him no like that? Jeez. I've told people tonight. <coughs> this is the kind of message that I really don't particularly like to bring. It's going to be very topical in nature. And uh, early in my ministry, when I would bring a message like this, I would always say, uh, if you get offended by something I say tonight, get offended with God, but don't shoot the messenger. And then it came to me how, what a privilege and an honor it is to be a messenger. So if you see something in God's word tonight that makes you angry with him, Consequently, makes you angry with me. I'm in good company. Amen. So we have a topic tonight. The topic is we talk about this a lot in uh, worship services. You hear it mentioned in a passing in a sermon. Somebody will say something about sin, <clears throat> but we really don't delve into it. We really don't deal with it. I just felt like God was laying on my heart to really deal in this subject tonight. Calvin Coolidge was the 30th president of the United States. And I'm told that he was a man of few words, but also a man of faith. And there's a story told about President Coolidge. He came home from a worship service one Sunday, and his wife said, how was the worship service? He said, well, it was good. And she said, well, what did the preacher preach about? He said, well, he preached about what God says about sin. Well, that was piqued her interest. And so she said, well, what did he say God said about sin? He said, he's against it. <laughs> Man, a few words. So I began to look at the definitions. The dictionary definition of sin <coughs> is to... Uh, any, rep any reprehensible or regrettable action. Well, that's kind of kind of lame, as Moses says. So I decided to go a little further. I looked at the Hebrew word that translates to sin, which is shatah. That's probably a very poor pronunciation of that word. And in the Hebrew, it's a noun meaning indiscretion, particularly youthful, evil committed against another, trespass against God and a general state of sinfulness and rebellion. That's a little better. And then I went and looked at the Greek word, which is hamartano. That's a noun meaning to miss the mark, to err from the truth, to commit errors in action, and to do wrong. So all those are pretty good definitions of the actual act of sin. What the Bible actually says about sin is it's the transgression of the law of God. That it's that's simply put, it uh, absolutely gets right to the point though. And I will tell you this as I move through this message tonight, I'm going to end up most of the time in uh, 1 John but I'm also going to have a lot of other scriptures I want you to see. But as I said, the Bible de definition of sin, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For, this, for sin is a transgression of the law. So the transgression of the law, when did that start? Almost after the beginning of time and creation as we know it. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. God is talking first to Abel and then to Cain. And he is telling them what, how he wants them to live their lives. We know that Cain's offering was unacceptable. Abel's offering was acceptable. And the reason was because of the condition of the heart. Abel gave the 
very best he could give. He loved the Lord God so much. He came, not so much. He gave, but it was begrudgingly. God says to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, and I'm not going to do all the thou shouts and that. I, I do come to King James, but I'll, I'll try to modernize it a little bit for you younger folks. If you do well, you will, if you do well, you will be accepted. And if you do not well, sin lieth at the door. And then he goes on and says, And unto thee shall be his desire. His desire means the desire of Satan. And thou shalt rule over him. So he said, make a choice, Cain. Make a choice. If you do good, if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do what I'm telling you to do, things are going to go real well for you. But if you choose to follow the other path, if you choose to go the other direction, sin lies at your doorstep and it's not going to go well for you. You know, we have to have to make those decisions in our life. And we are going to talk about making those decisions a lot tonight. So, before we go any further, let's pray. I ask that you pray for me because, uh, like I say, this is not my favorite topic by a long shot. So let's pray together, guys. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Thank you for the conviction, Lord, that you brought upon me in these past couple of weeks as I've worked on preparing this message. Lord, you know my heart. And you know, Lord, I really, really want to help your people be uplifted and challenged. And Lord, I know that sin kills and destroys. So Lord, just move mightily among us tonight. Let your word go forth. Let your Holy Spirit have total dominance, Lord. Move forward as we go. Bless us. Lord, let us be prepared as we leave here to live closer to you every day. Let us live a life that is very pleasing to Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And Father, be, let us be very faithful to give you all honor, glory, and praise because you and you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. So I started out and said that <clears throat> that uh, sin is transgressing the law of God. 1 John 5, 17 says, All unrighteousness is sin. So, Everything that we do that's against God it becomes a sinful action. It's not too hard, whoops, it's not too hard to know what that is. Because he points things out in the Bible. He tells us this is right, this is wrong. And as we go along, I would say this that. What constitutes sin is our actions, our words, our unspoken thoughts even, and our attitudes. Anything that does not imitate Christ. Did you know that we can be led into sin simply by not doing what is good? Did you know that? James 4.17 says, To those who know to do good and do not do it, to them, that is sin. So think about that. Think about if God's laid on your heart at some point to do something that would be beneficial and help somebody. But it was a little costly. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. Maybe it would take some money. And you just went, well, that'd be pretty good. It'd be nice if I would do that for them. I just don't think I'm going to go there. I just don't think I'm led into that. I, I think I'll just go along and do my thing myself. God's word says when we choose to do it that way, we're sinning. Did you ever think about that? that ever, did, did that ever 
come to you that just because I chose not to do something good, then I was caught up in, in a sin that transgresses the law of God? Wow. Probably most of us never really consider that. So who sins? Everybody in here can raise their hand and say, yeah, me, all. Yeah, we all sin. Uh, passage you're probably really familiar with, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. We've done something wrong. Ephesians 2.1 says that those that are lost in their trespasses are dead already. I just hopefully can bring to you as we go through this tonight how important it is to really, really desire to serve our Lord and be living that holy and righteous life he has called us to live because it is so, so tremendously important. I'll share with you another scripture. I'm going to come back yet a couple of times. scripture I want to share with you. Romans chapter 3, 9 through 18. What then? Are we better than they? Jesus here is talking about the Jews, his chosen people. No, in no wise we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles. They are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all going out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is in their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction or misery and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Did you hear that? Those that are living a life that is permeated by sin have no peace. Sin disrupts the peace of people. Sin will take and confuse and confound and just absolutely ruin a life that should be full of joy and peace. That's a real good place to say amen. So, <laughs> Understand this too. Sin's a choice. Sin is a choice. We're going to deal with that considerably tonight because we make the choice to do whatever we, we decide looks good to us. And as we get involved in that kind of a situation, <coughs> get involved in that kind of a situation. Mm -mm -mm. See, I told you this wasn't going to be a very uplifting day tonight. So let's say we decided and we're doing something that's sinful. What are the consequences? What are the consequences of sin? We all know Romans 6.23, or probably we do, that uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We all want that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't sound very excited about that. You almost sound like that congregation that the preacher was preaching one time, and he was preaching about sin, and he got to a point, and he says, all of you want to go to heaven, stand up. And everybody stood up but one guy in the congregation, and the preacher Walk down to him and he says, Sir, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? 
And he said, oh, certainly, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I thought you were getting up and loaded to go right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes, guys. We kind of we kind of dance around this. We don't really deal with it. Did you know that the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 34, that when we sin, we become servants of sin? If you translate that out, it actually means in the Greek word that you appear in a humble and despised condition. Romans 6, 16. Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves to obey, his servants you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk around trod down, stomped on, and living in a despised condition. Is that where you want to be? I'm just I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think. I have never known anybody who come to me and says, I just hope I can get people to despise me more. I come to people a lot of times who say, I want to be loved more. So how do we do that? We live in righteous. We live in righteousness. We strive to serve God in a righteous situation. So if we've been through all of this, and we've talked about it, and we've pretty much, does everybody agree with me that a sinful state is not where we want to live? Right. Yeah. Live? And if we are sure that the Bible is against sin, and as President Coolidge said, that God's against sin, and we have God's word who tells us what sin is, then why do we do it? Why do we do it? Good question, right? Well, I believe, myself personally, it is pretty much tied up in one verse of the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says this, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You realize that when Jesus was tempted, he was tempted in these three areas? Check it out. Matthew chapter 4 will tell you all about it. But even way before that, way before that, Genesis. We've had this sin problem for a long time, folks. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise, that's the pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it to her husband with her and also her husband did eat with her. What did she see? She saw that it was good to look at. <coughs> she saw that it was pleasing to taste and she saw that she had the ability to begin to be like God. That's what she actually says. You know, so interesting, Marty says it all the time when we, I hear people talk about this sin and, you know, well, Eve sinned and all that. And Marty says, yeah, uh, she might have offered it to Adam, but she didn't offer it as apple pie. And there's a lot of truth in that. Because if you go through that whole account there, we're good about passing the buck. You know that? Particularly when we're doing something wrong. Have you ever noticed when somebody gets caught up doing something wrong, it's not my fault because... Anybody know anybody like that? Not my fault. I didn't do it. Not my fault because when, when God had that conversation with Adam and Eve, first he went to Adam because, see, Adam was given direct revelation. God said, you will not eat of this tree. Absolutely will not. God had direct revelation. I believe that right after that's when Adam failed Eve. Because evidently he didn't teach her and impress upon her 
everything God meant when he said that. So when God questioned him about it, what's Adam do? He pretty much says, not my fault, God. It was that woman you gave me. It's almost like he wants to indict God for what he did wrong. I mean, come on. So, and then God goes to Eve and says, what did you do? And she goes, not my fault. The serpent deceived me. Satan is a great deceiver. So we've had this problem since the beginning of time. We haven't learned a lot. If you stop and think about things in your life that are wrong and you've done wrong and you've had problems with, do they not all gather up in one of these three things? The lust of the flesh? I think it will be gratifying instantly. The lust of the eyes? That looks like something I would like to do. And the pride of life? By golly, I can do it. I have the ability to do it. As I was studying this, I, it just dawned on me, and I was working on it today and during the last couple of weeks. God begins dealing with this problem in his word on this side of this group of pages. On this side of this group of pages, he's still dealing with the self-same issue. How much did we learn from the beginning towards the end of the book? Not a lot, guys. Not a lot. We need to choose who we're going to obey. We need to choose today for the rest of our lives who we're going to obey. We're either going to obey our Savior, Jesus Christ, unto righteousness, or we're going to obey Satan unto death and sin. Period. And it's black and white choice. There's no gray area. There's no little bit of sin that keeps us from being righteous and holy. Sin is sin. No matter how little, no matter how much. All sin separates us from God. All sin separates us from God. So if we're fighting that battle and we need to know what we, how we're going, how are we going to do this? How are we going to defeat this in our lives? Do you want to defeat sin in your life? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I would hope. Yeah. I would hope. Well, guess what? God's Word, Amen. once again, Amen. tells us exactly how we can do this. And all we have to do is listen. Amen. Romans chapter 12. It's going to be very familiar to a lot of you. Romans chapter 12. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So we need to renew our thoughts. We need to become spiritually minded. And that, that statement there about being the renewing of our mind says that we need to be qualitatively renovated so we become a different individual. Did you get that? Qualitatively renovated so we become a different individual. I have to deal with my thoughts. I have to take my thoughts captive. I have to deal with them every day because when I come to a point where in my flesh I would say, boy, this looks good to me. Let me go this direction. I'll look at my mind and, let, and change it around and say, wait a minute. Can you watch this? What's God's word say about this issue that I'm fighting with? What's God's word tell me that I need to do? <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I love the way King James says it. Some of the other versions, I think maybe water it down a little bit. But it talks about being encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, and we need to lay aside the, the sin and the weights which so easily besets us. That's not a word we use a lot 
in our English language today. Anybody ever come up to you and say, I am beset with? No. Yeah. Probably not. But that besetting sin, and everybody's got one. Do you know that? What is challenging and tempting to me may not be challenging and tempting to you, and vice versa. What's challenging and tempting to you may not be to me, but we all have something that is tempting and challenging to us, correct? Mm -hmm. Isn't there something in your life that you thought you came to that point and you went, I did that again, mm -hmm. and I swore I'd never do that again. again. That's that besetting sin. That's that thing that God has convicted you of and Satan knows how to get a chink in the armor. And he says, this is how I can get a hold of that person. And we need to pray and we need to, we need to just beseech God. God, whatever that thing is that's besetting me, whatever that thing is that's giving me a problem, deliver me from it. You know what? That's what is so important about Monday night prayer. Because as we come together corporately and we share with one another that we have problems. And I'm not going to tell you what sin besets me. Just like I don't particularly tell you. You don't need to tell me what sin besets you. The fact is that we're all in the same boat. We've all got that problem. But when we come together on Monday night as a group and we say, Lord, Lord, affect our lives. Lord, deal with whatever we're dealing with. Lord, you can change this. I don't have to live this way. Because God, you are able. You are able to change whatever I'm fighting. Your Holy Spirit can move in me and convict me. And I can make a difference in my life because I choose to serve you, not Satan. Amen. So everybody's going to be here Monday night, right? <laughs> I hope, I hope the majority of, majority of us are here Monday night. That's a blessed, blessed time in this church. Blessed time in this church. Romans 8.13 says that we have to put to death. King James actually used the word mortify the sins of the flesh. We have to decide that those things are going to die to us. We don't want to do anymore. What happens when something's dead? Nothing. It has no effect. It's absolutely gone. If we'll mortify those things, if we will bring them into a point of, this is dead to me. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. I want to turn this over to my, to, to my, my Savior my deliverer. I am going to renew my mind. I'm going to have different thoughts. I'm going to do differently. So how are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to get delivered from sin? Too bad you asked. Too bad you asked. Because the Bible's pretty specific again. Isn't the Bible wonderful? Yes, it is. Don't you love the Bible? Yes. yes. Amen. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation to them who, little small word, huge ramifications, to them who, which are in Christ. In Christ. Baptized into the body of Christ. Moses Christ dwelling in, so in Christ Jesus. And who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit is life in Christ. Made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, then that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
you're a spirit-filled, born-again Christian, we're not coming into condemnation. <coughs> you know, that, that's getting pretty close to shouting ground when we realize that we're not under condemnation anymore. Because you know what? Before Christ, that's where we all were. Correct? Were we all fighting that? We were all living a life that was condemned. We were condemned because And deliver us from it. We ought to be terribly, terribly happy about that. Do you know it is to God's glory to forgive sin? Think about that. It glorifies God when he forgives the sin that we fight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Doesn't that make you happy? Well, as I kind of begin to get towards the bottom line here, and I've got a couple of questions. And these aren't trick questions, but uh, we're going to delve into them a little bit as I go further. First of all, I'd like How many in this room would sit here and say they are born again believers? Jesus Christ is their Savior. Okay, pretty much everybody. Well, First John 1 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Great. Amen. You like that? Happy about that? All right. If you've got a Bible, and I hope you've been, had a Bible, and I hope you're following along, go to, go to 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to be in verses 7, 8, and 9. We've all said we're born again believers, vast majority of us. We've all said we still struggle with sin, correct? First John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Little children, that's us, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he, Jesus Christ, is righteous. That's good. Like that? I like that. Sounds good to me. He that commits sin is of the devil. Okay, amen. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose God was manifest that he might destroy the works of sin and the devil. That's, I like that a lot, don't you? Hmm? Jesus Christ was manifest to destroy the works of sin and the devil. Then we get to, to verse 9. Whoever is born of God, would that not be us who, is, who are redeemed in Jesus Christ? Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his sin remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that hates his brother. What are we going to do about this? 
We've all just confessed that we're Christians. We've all just confessed that we're believers. We've all just confessed that we deal with sin. And God's word has just said in 1 John 1, or 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 9, if you're born of God, you cannot sin. Hmm. Actually, the translation should be a little different. And the, the New Living more alludes to the translation of the Greek because the Greek better translation be the one who practices sin cannot sin. That's interesting, the one who practices sin. That, that simply means that a believer cannot sin habitually, deliberately, easily, and maliciously. So you cannot, I cannot, none of us can continue to live in a life that is sinful, that we know is sinful, that we know is against the word of God, and be truly righteous in Jesus Christ. You with me? Hurts, doesn't it? Hurts, doesn't it? Because we all deal with something. We all deal with something. So, the fact is this. When you became born again, when you became a saved human being, the Holy Spirit indwelt you. And when I and you and any of us who are in Christ are going down the wrong path, the Holy Spirit is going to convict us. And conviction's not fun, guys. Did you know that? But he's going to come and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is against what your Savior is telling you to do. And he's even going to come against it strong enough to we're going to say, I can't do that anymore. I can't go down that road anymore and honor my Savior. Wow. Why do people pray so diligently for other people for deliverance? Because they want to come from that point that is binding and sinful and where they make the choice to say, I'm not going to obey the Bible. I'm not going to obey Jesus Christ, but I'm going to go a different way. And the Bible says, we're in terrible danger then. We're in terrible danger then. Now the good news is, I'm glad there's good news at the end of this. Amen. After Paul has said all of this, he also tells us a couple of things. First John 1, 8, Paul realizes, or excuse me, John realizes that we're all in this boat together. And so in John, 1 John 1, 8, he says, if we say we, know have, we, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, verse 2, my little children, us, these things I write unto you that you sin not. But then good news. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So when that sin that so easily besets me and you and us comes upon us, Jesus Christ intercedes for us. And he says, Father, they're one of mine. They're one of mine. Don't charge them with this because I paid for it on the cross. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. First John 1, 9. Boy, this gets beat up a lot. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what do you do when sin is coming laying at the doorstep? What do you do with it? Gosh, has anybody been listening? What do you do with that sin when it's laying at your doorstep? You confess it. Amen. You come and say, Father, I have sinned. I have done something wrong. And it's laying at my doorstep. And it's eating me up. And it's killing me. And God the Father says, it's all right. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. And because you confess them, and all we're doing when we confess sin to God is we're, we are agreeing with the Father that what he says is right and what we did is wrong. That's all we're doing. You know what's so interesting to me? Does he add anything to confession? Hmm? If you confess your sins and make sure you ask for forgiveness and make sure you go to church and make sure that you read your Bible every day and make sure you do this and that and the other and blah, blah, blah. What does he say? If you're born again, and there is the crux of the whole issue, if you are saved, if you're a redeemed human being and you confess that sin to God, he says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. If there ever need to be a hallelujah, right there, there need to be a hallelujah. hallelujah. God says he'll forgive you if you just come to him and say, it's me again, Lord. I blew it. And really, that's, all, that's as simple as it needs to be. It's me again, Lord. I blew it. But understand this. There is a difference between where we are positionally and operationally. Positionally, I'm righteous in Christ. You're righteous in Christ. Operationally, the way I function in this world, yeah, not so much sometimes. Marty knows me better than anybody else in the world, and she could confess to that, that I am far from perfect. <laughs> a little too readily to confession, but... I'm far from perfect. But the good news is, I'm not in the boat alone. You're far from perfect too. So guys, here's the bottom. And I want to end with this one statement. I'm going to ask Tom to come back up if he will. Because I want us to reflect a little bit. I want, to I want to end in this verse in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. In this, the children of God, who are the children of God? Yes. We are, amen. And the children of the devil, those that are unsaved, whoever does not righteousness is not a God. All the way down to the bottom. I hope that's Jesus calling. The very last few words of 1 John 3.10. And to me, this is how we're going to prove this type of a message, how we get past sin. Neither is he that loveth not his brother. We need to fall in love with each other. We need to fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ. And we need to fall in love with each other tonight. We need to decide that we're going to forgive one another for the time we fail each other. We need to decide we're going to apply what this says. We need to decide we're going to lift each other up in prayer, that we are going to support one another. We're going to show love for one another. We're not going to talk about each other other than to say, God, may we please bless my brother or sister, especially if they're dealing with a situation that they need to be delivered from. 
and we're going to decide to let our mind be renewed. And we're going to be qualitatively different. That's a strong statement. Qualitatively different. Not like I was before, but the way God's called me to be. So the challenge is this as I stop tonight. If there's anything that you need to confess, you don't need to confess it to me. I couldn't help you anyway. But if there's anything you need to confess, take a little time, confess it to the Lord, and say, Lord, I want to live that righteous life. I want to be what you've called me to be. I want to be released from the bondage of sin. And just lift that up to him in the next couple of moments. As I lead us in a word of prayer, and then we are going to take an offering here in just a moment. Father God, I have no idea if I've done your word justice tonight. Father, I know what's on my heart. Lord, I know that we who love you struggle with the sins of this life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lord, we need your deliverance every day. Lord, I've preached this message to a group of believers, to people who profess to love you, profess to know you, and profess to have obtained the salvation that can only come through you by the cross of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, if we're struggling, we can only imagine how those outside of Christ are struggling. Lord, let us be very faithful in lifting up and glorifying Jesus in being that people who want to deal with sin when it lies at the doorstep. We want to confess it immediately. We want to be delivered from it, Lord. And we want to live holy and righteous lives as much as we possibly can that you would be honored and you would be glorified and people would see that and they would want what you have given to us and they would want to come to you. And Lord, people would fall in love with you all over this world. Lord, I pray you would use this message to maybe uplift some, to maybe challenge others. I pray it's been a blessing, Lord. The time we've spent together, it's definitely been a blessing to me. And I pray you, these, your people, Lord, will walk out of here tonight choosing to be totally in love with you and one another. Lord, that you might take us to greater heights together. Lord, as we just quietly come before your throne for a few moments. I'm going to ask that if anyone needs to come up, they feel free to do so. You don't have to move at all. You can stay in your seat. But I do pray that for the next few moments that you would, if there's anything that any of us needs to confess and bring before our Savior, we would do that. And we would pray for that deliverance. And Lord, if anyone needs to, I'm sure that Carlos and Alicia are right here. They can come and be close. So if you need, Lord, for any of us to move, we will be at the front. And Lord, we will pray with anyone that comes. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit have dominance. Lord, let nobody out of embarrassment or fear not come tonight confessing that they need your forgiveness and your cleansiness, your cleansing and your move to righteousness.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the hearts that are being dealt with tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you're bestowing on each one of us. And Lord, as we take the next few moments and worship you with our giving, Lord, bless that one that can give and that one that can't give. And Lord, use whatever gifts we give tonight to further the cause and the ministry of Jesus Christ and to further the gospel in this world, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us tonight. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank that you loved us before we were ever able to love you. And we do love you tonight, Lord, and we do pray your blessing. 